Hi everyone, my name is Shem. I run a website called audionostalgia.co.uk where I review vintage and modern loudspeakers. I also use this website for publishing my articles about hi-fi related subjects. And I have recently written an article about challenges in testing hi-fi equipment. And I thought it would be a good idea to also make a YouTube video about it because YouTube is a, such a great platform for sharing knowledge. Um, the video is going to be quite long. There are quite a lot of different subjects to cover. So I've put together shortcuts in the description down below the video. So if you cannot be bothered to watch it all, or you're just interested in a particular section of the video, just use the shortcuts uh, in the description to jump to the section that you are actually interested in. So without further ado, let's get on with it. Challenges in hi-fi testing. What do I mean by it? Well, over past 10 years, I have compared a number of various hi-fi gear. I have also reviewed multiple loudspeakers. And I've learned that sometimes what I perceive as difference is actually to do with the external factors affecting my perception rather than change in gear itself. And with this video, I'm not trying to convince you that there are or there are no differences between any particular type of equipment. I'm simply sharing my own personal experience uh, and the challenges I discovered with hi-fi testing in a hope that you will learn something new from it if you don't already know it. And remember, there is no one easier to fool than yourself. Let's start with challenge number one, associated equipment and location. Whenever you run any sort of test, you want to ensure that all, other, all external factors are eliminated and you're only concentrating on the variable that you are testing. And this applies to Hi-Fi 2. And what I mean by it is that you often hear people, uh, including myself, making comments about how a particular piece of equipment sounded in comparison to what they have at home. And this is quite incorrect and there are two fundamental problems with that. The first one is that when you're listening to something, let's say at the dealers, the likelihood that they've got the very same associated equipment as you do at home is very slim. So you're not only comparing one piece of equipment, you're actually comparing the whole setup. So whole setup of what you've got at home to whole setup of what you've got at the dealers, which again, it's meaningless because if you're only looking for changing one particular piece of equipment, whether it's an amplifier, DAC, CD player, loudspeakers, you want to isolate it and you want to only test that one particular thing, not the whole setup. So that's the first challenge. Even in a very unlikely scenario where the dealers have the very same equipment in the showroom as you've got at home and they are able to set it up for you so it's like for like and the only thing that's changing is the piece of equipment that you're actually interested in. The problem is that the room is different and room is the fundamental part of what we're hearing. And if you don't believe me, I'm gonna share with you my personal experience. Because since I, since I started playing uh, with Hi-Fi, I lived in three different properties and I had the same setup in three different rooms and it sounded very different to the point that in one of the rooms I actually didn't like the sound of it whereas I absolutely loved it in the other room. So that's, the room plays a significant part in what we're hearing. So that's, that's the second problem with, with drawing any conclusions from that. And this is why you often get people going to the dealers, really liking something, bringing it back, ho back home, and then realizing that they don't actually like the sound of it or they don't like it as much as they did when they were playing it at the dealers. And the only difference is it's a different room. So we've got this... Uh, there's two problems here and the question is what can be done about it. So my, my first piece of advice would be to only change one component at the time. Try to avoid situations when you're changing multiple things because you're just gonna confuse yourself and you won't be able to attribute the differences that you're hearing to any particular piece of equipment. And the second advice here would be to test everything in your own room or if it's not your own room, test it in the very same room. So if you cannot borrow equipment to bring it back home and test it in your own home, bring over your equipment to the dealers and try to test it there. It's not ideal, but it's still better than testing equipment in two separate rooms. So that's for challenge number one and potential solutions. Challenge number two, audio volume and its impact on how we hear things. So let me point out a couple of things first. 
The first one is how much difference do we need in the loudness in order for us to perceive difference between two sounds. And there are many academic papers that cover the subject, but the conclusion is that it's frequency dependent. So with certain frequencies, uh, you need as little as 0.25 decibel for us to be able to perceive the difference. With other frequencies, you might need as much as 9 decibels to notice the difference between two sounds. So you've got a range of, you know, 0.25 to 9 decibels. So that's the first thing and it's related to differences in sound, right? Then the second thing that I would like to point out is uh, research conducted by Fletcher and Munson in 1930s and then late, later improved I think in 1950s by Robson and Datson where um, they've tried to identify um, how sensitive our hearing is uh, to different frequencies at different SPL level. So the, the, the outcome of this research was that basically our hearing is not only not linear, but it's also dependent on the volume. And, uh, you know, to sum it up uh, at the very basic level, what that means in practice that at the lower listening levels, we hear less bass and less treble, whereas as the volume goes up, we hear more treble and more bass. The, the, the hearing curve is never linear, uh, but it gets closer to it as the, volumes go, go up, as the volume goes up. So when you combine these two things together, you can, easily con you can easily see and conclude how important the balanced levels are to any listening test. Because, for instance, you might have one piece of equipment uh, playing slightly louder than the other equipment that you're comparing it to, and you're hearing differences. But the question is, are those differences because the other piece of equipment playing slightly louder, or are those differences as a result of that equipment, let's say, being better or worse than the equipment that you're comparing it to? And you can easily see why this can become problematic because, uh, you know, naturally, at least uh, from my own experience, uh, up to a certain level, we are attracted to slightly louder sounds. And if, you know, if you, let's say, have one piece of equipment that plays slightly louder than the other, let's say it's 0.25 decibels, you know, your perception might be that the piece of equipment that uh, plays louder has a slightly greater resolution in treble or you hear more details in there and you automatically attribute this detail, attribute that, uh, uh, that fact to that equipment being better or something along these lines, whereas the reality might be uh, that you're hearing it only because it plays slightly louder and you perceive it as a, let's say, greater resolution in treble area. So what can be done about it? Well, there are a couple of things. For anything but speakers, uh, it's usually a good idea to get yourself a multimeter or a voltmeter capable of measuring a high frequency alternating current and use it uh, to balance the output at your sp amplifier speaker terminals. And what I mean by that, so for example, if you, um, if you, Testing, different, testing two different ducts, right? And you're using a CD player as a source. So what you would do, you would burn yourself a CD with a wide noise, and that would be a kind of measuring sound, if you wish. Uh, you would put that in CD, you would plug in your first duct between CD and your amplifier, you would get it to the volume that you're happy with, and then you would measure uh, voltage at the end of your amplifier speaker terminals, right? You'd make a note mod of you would make a note of that voltage, and then you would make a note of the position of where your amplifier volume control knob is, or at least mark it. I usually use something like a painter's tape for it, just to make sure it doesn't leave any residue. Um, then you would unplug the duct, you would put the second duct, duct that you are testing, and you would do uh, the very same exercise. But let's say the second duct has got a slightly higher output, which means that you've got uh, a lot, you've got more voltage at the end of your speaker terminals. So you would then go back to your amplifier and turn the volume knob down to ensure that the uh, voltage that you measure at the speaker terminals is exactly the same as with the first duct. And then again, you would mark the volume control knob on your amplifier in the second position and you would, you know, obviously ensure that the vol voltage is the same in that position. So when you switch between them, then you've got the reference point to make sure that with duct number one, your volume needs to be here. With that duct number two, your volume control knob needs to be here. And that's how you would go about it. And you could do it for every single piece of gear, right? 
This is a little bit more complex when it gets to speakers, because speakers come with different sensitivities and what that means in practice that with the same output from your amplifiers, different speakers will play at different SPL levels. And, um, you know, with that in mind, uh, measuring voltage at the speaker amplifier terminals, it's probably not the best idea. So how I work around it is I use my SPL meter, so I put it as close as I can to the listening position and make sure that it's always in that position when I switch the speakers and see what, uh, you know, what SPL reading am I gonna get when I play my wide noise. So I always choose something that's got the broad frequency spectrum as a noise generation uh, to make sure that it covers uh, you know whole bandwidth uh, as opposed to just a narrow frequency band because when you think about it if I was to play a sine wave with like a, a one kilohertz you know one speaker might have a peak at the sine wave and the other can have a dip so if I use that for balancing the SPL level uh, that's gonna give me uh, really bad results so in order to avoid it I always use like a kind of noise it doesn't have to be wide noise uh, but I, I always use noise with a broad frequency spectrum um, just to make sure that you know it, it, that the SPL level is a result of all frequencies not just one particular frequency so once I do that the, the, the process is very similar to what we've covered with uh, example that I've given you about DAX. So you put the first set of speakers, right? You mark the, you get them to the volume uh, level that you're happy and comfortable with. Then you mark that on your amplifier or even better, if you've got a uh, digital reading, you can just make a note of that. And then you unplug those speakers, put the second speakers, measure your uh, decibel level. And you know, if it's either too low or if it's too high, you adjust the volume knob on your amplifier accordingly and mark that position when the SPL level in the same position is exactly the same as what you've had with your first set of speakers. And this way when you switch between the speakers you've got two references marked on your amplifier and you know exactly where to put the volume control knob in order to get uh, well not exactly the same but similar loudness level at your sitting position. You know it's a bit of a workaround but it's still better than doing nothing. So that's a solution for speakers. Challenge number three, auditory memory and time between listening sessions. Let me ask you this, how confident are you that the sound that you remember is accurate? And how long could you remember it for? Five seconds, five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour, couple of days? You know, what, what time scales are we talking about? I and you know I've heard other people including myself uh, comparing stuff to what I've heard a couple of years ago to what I'm hearing now and and kind of trying to draw conclusions oh yeah the speakers that I've heard last year on the sh show sounded much better than this speakers and things like this really I mean are you confident about what you're actually saying and the reason why I'm challenging is because our auditory memory isn't that great? And to illustrate the point, I'm going to use an analogy of our visual memory. So you should be able to see on the screen a picture that I've taken during one of our trips to Scotland. Um, and I'm gonna put that picture on the screen first, let you look at it for a couple of seconds. So, you know, have a look at it now. Then we're gonna go into a black screen, so you see nothing, couple of seconds break, and then I'm gonna display that picture again, except I photoshopped a couple of things out, okay? So look at the second picture now, and tell me if you can tell what have I photoshopped out. Do you actually remember what's missing from the first picture? I very much doubt it, unless you've got like a, a you know, really good visual memory, 99% of people won't be able to tell. Now let me show you something different. I'm gonna put the very first picture on the screen again and switch instantly to the second picture, okay? So have a look. You're looking at the picture number one now, flipping it to the second one, right? And flipping it back to the first one again. Have a look. Can you see how much easier it is to notice differences once you flip from one to the other? You know, because you, your eye gets automatically drawn to the things that change on the picture. Whereas if you've got any break in between, it's so much harder to actually tell what's changed. 
Even if it's a couple of seconds of looking at the black screen, it's so much harder, right? So the same principles apply to auditory memory. When you switch between things instantly, it's much easier to notice differences. Whereas if you have to wait for any amount of time, and obviously the longer, the longer it is that you have to wait, the worse it is in terms of noticing differences. So if you've listened to something, uh, let's say right now, and then you came back a day later and listened to something different, could you reliably tell what the differences are between those two listening sessions? You know, I very much doubt it. So what can we do about this? Well, what we need to do here is to minimize the time delay between listening sessions. And it's not always easy to do, but in the past I've built myself a relay based box, which is basically a simple box with a multi-way relay inside. It also has a, a radio controlled remote. And what that means is that I can be sitting on my sofa and without getting up, I can just click the remote and it switches and the remote is switching the relay to another position, which means that I can instantly switch between two pieces of equipment, right? So for most of the things like DACs, amplifiers and this type of equipment, this works really well. And yes, some people might argue, hey, relay might be detrimental to the sound, but reality is, if it's detrimental to the sound, it's gonna be exactly the same for one piece of equipment as much as the other one. So, you know, the differences that you hear between the two st should still be valid. Moreover, you've got plenty of relays in your amplifier and I, you know, don't hear people complaining about those relays. So, you know, take it with a pinch of salt. This is slightly more problematic when it gets to loudspeakers. And there, there are a couple of reasons for it. The first one is that uh, if you build a relay box, you have to ensure that it's capable of handling slightly higher power because you're talking about power coming from your amplifier to the loudspeakers, which will be a, a lot greater than what you've got between your gear. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is the fact that loudspeakers come in different sensitivities, which I already touched on that in, my previ in, in the ch previous challenge that I've described. So even though you can switch instantly between them, you still have to adjust the volume to make sure that they are balanced, right? So, uh, you know, it, it, it's not ideal, but it still helps. So it, what I do, actually I'm lucky enough that the amplifier that I use, it has a switch. So I've got two uh, loudspeaker outputs. So I can switch between uh, loudspeaker set A and loudspeaker set B. And, uh, you know, I've used a piece of wooden stick and while I'm sitting on the sofa and just trying to get initial impressions from loudspeakers, I switch between them and adjust the volume level accordingly just to make sure that, you know, uh, I'm getting the same output from both. Again, it's not ideal, but it helps. And also something to add to this is that it's not ideal to test loudspeakers near each other. I, uh, I use it as a first stage of testing, so I always put them side by side and switch between them just to get a feeling for what the loudspeakers are about and how they differ to what I currently have. However, uh, you know, that's not to replace the longer listening test. So I, I usually take one set of speakers away and just put the set that I'm actually testing. So you do a combination of both, not just relying on switching between. Challenge number four, biases. For those of you not familiar with the term, bias is a disproportionate weighting in favor or against an idea, thing, or a person. And over the years, psychologists have identified a number of different cognitive biases. But for the purpose of this video, I'm just gonna outline a few that I think affect us the most. The first one and most critical one, in my opinion, is placebo effect. And you might be familiar with this bias from medical experiments. So when a, when a new drug is being tested, usually the test subjects are split into three different groups. You've got a test group, which are the people who receive the medicine. You have a placebo group, which are the people who think they receive medicine, but in fact they receive something that looks like medicine, but it's got no uh, medical properties. And then you've got a third group, which is a control group, uh, which are people who receive no medicine at all, right? And what often happens when you compare the results of these experiments, people who receive the uh, placebo, so people who receive the things that they were led to believe are medicine, uh, actually show similar results to the people who receive the actual medicine. 
And this is only because they strongly believed that they were getting medicine, which is one of those peculiarities. So when you think about it in the context of hi-fi, it's actually scary because often before you know making any judgments, we are preloaded with a lot of stuff. So we read articles and we read reviews and we 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 you know share opinions with our friends on, on the internet forums and we absorb those too. So before you even start listening to any of the gear, you're already preloaded to expect certain things from it. And I'll give you an example from my own experience how strong the placebo can be. So my best friend, he, at the time he lived in Germany and he flew over to visit us and stay with us for a, for a week or so. And he's into hi-fi as well, but uh, in contrast to me, he is not bothered about CDs. He does a lot of streaming and high resolution files. I've not really got any experience with high resolution files. So I was kind of interested to hear his thoughts about them. And as a matter of fact, he had, um, he had some sample files on his phone. So he had the same piece of music recorded in different resolutions coming from kind of CD quality to the you know highest resolution that was available at the time and we decided to run a little bit of a test so we set everything up we've plugged everything in and we started listening and we were sitting on the sofa you know and switching between different uh, resolutions of the files and sure enough as soon as he started switching to the higher resolution files I was like yeah that sounds better I think it sounds better I prefer that and you know I was getting um, really intrigued let's say to the point that after those listening tests I thought maybe I should start selling my CDs and get into streaming or in high resolution files and you know I was puzzled enough to actually ask him to do a blind test because you know although I was intrigued I was also sensible enough to try to verify my perception so what we ended up doing is actually comparing the uh, lowest resolution file to the highest resolution file. And we had, uh, I think we, we had 20 goes each. So first I was sitting on the sofa and not really knowing what I'm listening to. And my friend was switching it for me and I was making notes, right? So uh, I've, I went through 20, 20 goes and then my friend did the same thing. And you know what it turned out? That when we actually looked at the results, Afterwards, I think 55% of our answers were wrong. So, you know, ask yourself, why is it? You know, I would have had the same chance of getting this, this amount of incorrect un answers if I was guessing. And because that was it, there wasn't any, anything else to it. I mean, you know, when I started the blind test, I was actually questioning myself because previously I was quite confident in the differences I could hear. When it was a blind test, I was puzzled because I thought, well, actually, I don't hear as much as I thought I did. And it was the same for my friend. So then you can easily see how you can fool yourself when, uh, you know, you've got visual cues that tell you what you're supposed to be hearing. And that's it, that, that's the visual cue, because I was looking at his tablet and knowing what file he was playing, uh, my brain uh, was telling me that I perceived that file as a, as a better sounding, when the reality was, when we did the blind test, I couldn't tell the difference, right? And, and that's not to say that there is no difference between high resolution files, far from it. I'm just trying to point out that you can easily fool yourself and, you know, I, I tend to see myself as a fairly level-headed person. And yet, looking at the tablet, I was in it. I thought, yeah, I'm going to sell all of my CDs. I mean, this sounds great. And actually, it didn't. It was just my perception of it at the time when I was looking at what file is playing. So, yeah, you can see, you can see where I'm coming with this one. The next two biases that I would like to talk about are halo effect and implicit bias. So let's start with the first one, just to give you a bit of a definition. So the halo effect is basically when you're trying to attribute certain traits to a person or a thing based on other traits that they have. So for instance, uh, you might think that person with a kind face is a kind person, where the reality might be that that person is a serial killer and it's not kind at all, right? So that, that, that's the halo effect. The, Implicit bias, which is often referred to as stereotyping, is trying to attribute certain traits uh, because a person belongs to a certain group. 
so personal a thing. So for instance, you, you, you might hear people saying, oh, um, the, the, this was made in Germany, therefore uh, it's a good engineering and therefore it's a great product or something along these lines. Yes, there are a lot of good products from Germany, but there are also a lot of crap, crap products that come out of Germany. So, you know, you've, you don't have any evidence to say that only because uh, that particular product was made in Germany, it's automatically going to be well engineered, right? Uh, so that's what stereotyping or implicit bias is. So how does biases relate to hi-fi, you might ask? Well, in my opinion, these biases feed into your placebo bias. And let me illustrate it. So, for example, you are looking at the set of speakers. They, are, they, they cost a lot of money, they are made by a premium company, they look stunning, and, you know, if it's not conscious, you subconsciously have great expectations because you know that they are expensive, this is a high-end product, so you subconsciously expect it to sound great, right? Even though you don't have ev any evidence to support it, you're making that assumption. If it's conscious or unconscious, it's there. The second thing, um, and it relates to the implicit bias, is, um, for instance, you're looking for an amplifier, right? And you're listening to a transistor amplifier. You know that most transistor amplifiers sound uh, cold in comparison to valve amplifiers, right? They don't sound like tube amplifiers do. So you automatically assume that when you're listening to a transistor amplifier, it will have a transistor sound. The reality might be that the designer of that amplifier uh, set it up in the way that it sounds more tube-like, right? But you subconsciously assume that it's not going to because, you know, it belongs to a group of transistor amplifiers, okay? And to illustrate the point even further, I've watched an interesting video by uh, Dr. Floyd Toole when he was working at Harman and he conducted a lot of experiments where professional reviewers uh, were asked to rate the speakers. And then in the first test, they, are, they were asked to rate the speakers when they could see what speakers are playing. And in the second test, they were asked to see the speaker, they were asked to rate the speakers without seeing what speakers are playing, right? And what it turned out that people rate speakers differently when they see them. And the reason for that is bias. Because, you know, you might know that that speaker comes from a premium company, so you subconsciously will rate it higher. You also might hear things differently because you're actually looking at it and you had some great memories associated with speakers from that brand that you are just evaluating. So this is how powerful biases are. And, you know, there are no people that are free from biases. You might think you're objective, you're level-headed and so on. No, we are all affected by biases. So if you want to eliminate it, you know, you have to try hard to do so. The last two biases that I would like to talk about are confirmation bias and selective perception bias. So what are these? Well, the confirmation bias is a tendency for us to look for uh, materials or, or to look for things that support our existing beliefs, right? So we're automatically more attracted to things that uh, correspond to our belief system. Okay, the second bias, the selective perception bias, is somewhat similar, but it's a basically tendency for us to ignore things that contradict our belief system. So when you combine two of these biases together, you end up in a situation where you've got people that have a very narrow point of view because they only uh, get fed the information that they are interested in, or not necessarily interested in, but the information that support their belief system, and they also tend to ignore everything else that contradicts it, which is a scary situation, and you can clearly see it in, in politics, where you've got, you know, very polarized societies at the moment, where you've got one group of people watching only certain news and obtaining their information from a certain news channels, which tend to confirm their beliefs, and then you've got other group of people doing the very same thing and hardly anyone in between. So how do these biases relate to hi-fi? So similarly to the other two that we've just discussed, they feed, in my opinion, they feed placebo effect. Uh, so you end up in the situation where 
if you, you know, read so much about a particular equipment or speaker set or something like this, and you believe so strongly in it, you're so, uh, let's say, invested in it, that you're not only looking for the information that confirm that, that, you know, those speakers are great and so on and so on, but you also ignore everything uh, that contradicts it. And I, I, I've been guilty of that as well. I've fallen in love with certain speakers, and although they weren't... Uh, as good as I was led to believe, uh, I was still looking for information that supported that, you know, and if I read a, if I read a review and let's say um, 50% of that review was positive and 50% was negative, I only paid attention to the 50% that was positive. Because I want, you know, I pay, I, I, I given more weighting to the positive stuff than negative stuff. And, and again, that's bias. And it wasn't until I actually uh, compared the equipment to something else for a longer period of time when I started noticing, well, actually, you know, those speakers do not have a great resolution. And actually, I'm missing some details and so on and so on. So it, it was really hard to overcome it. Right, so we went through the list of all of these biases. The question is, what can we do about them? And as you might have noticed, there is one thing that all of those biases have in common, and it's visual cues. So in order to, you know, minimize the risk of these biases uh, taking effect, you want to remove the visual cues. And what that means for us in practice, when you conduct listening tests, it's good if they are blind listening tests. Because this way you can be sure that you're relying on your ears and not on your eyes telling your brain what your ears are supposed to be hearing, right? And if you want to take it a step further, you could go for a double blind test. And what I mean by it is that sometimes when you run tests, uh, and for instance, you're the one that's listening to something and your friend is switching for you, but your friend actually knows what is he switching from and to. In certain circumstances, you could pick up on your friend's body language, let's say that he's got a preference for a particular type of equipment, and when he switches to it, he's got a big grin on his face or something like this. So subconsciously, you'll automatically may, you, you might automatically uh, rate that uh, particular piece of equipment better because of the, because of the cues that you got from, uh, from your friend. So if you want to do a proper test, it would be ideal if you could do it as a double blind test, which means that neither yourself nor the person who's running the test actually know what's playing when. So when your friend is switching, he doesn't know any better than you do. And this way, you're not only uh, avoiding uh, seeing what you're switching from to, and you're also avoiding uh, your friend giving you any cues about uh, you know, what might be happening. So again, this is how I approach the test. It's not always possible to do double blind, but you know, single blind is a way to go if you want to stay objective and avoid biases. Challenge number five, lack of recording standards. I sometimes see reviewers, uh, let's say reviewing speakers, and uh, making comments like that uh, voice of a particular vocalist doesn't sound correct. My question to that is, how do you know what correct supposed to sound like? The reality is, if you're talking about, a, let's say, a popular singer, you've never heard them in an unamplified uh, environment. Most of the time, where, even when you attend concerts, you're hearing their voice, uh, which is already amplified few, uh, through big PA speakers. So you don't really know what the real is, right? So you see where I'm going with this. You don't really have a good reference point of what, uh, what, what the source supposed to sound like. And, um, you know, this goes even further because we don't really have recording standards. So you've got different studios using different speakers, different rooms and so on, mixing and mastering things differently. And that can result in a situation where if you have a studio that are, let's say, using a bass heavy speakers, uh, and they release recordings, when you listen to those recordings on the neutral sounding speakers, they will sound bass shy. And then you might have another studio, let's say, which is using a fairly dull sounding speakers. So when you put the recordings coming out of that studio, uh, or when you play recordings coming out of that studio on the fairly balanced speakers, they're gonna sound too bright. So, you know, we as a, you know, consumers of, of that music, we don't really know uh, what the truth is. 
unless you were there at the studio at the time when the album was mixed and you understand what the artist wanted to achieve and you've heard it at the time, you don't really know what the real means. And uh, this can be somewhat problematic because it leads to the situations where particular albums may sound uh, really good on one type of equipment and may not sound as good on the other type of equipment and vice versa. You know, you might have albums that sound really good on that, but don't sound as good on this, uh, which is a little problematic because ultimately, from our point of view, we would like to get to the source. So we would like our systems to be very truthful to how the source is supposed to sound like, and that's problematic. So the question is, what can be done about it? So there are a couple of things in here. The first one is, I would suggest whenever you test equipment to bring the wide selection of recordings. Don't only bring the well-recorded audio file albums that sound, tend to sound good on most of the equipment, also bring the music that might not necessarily sound good on your speakers. Bring different genres of music, different recording qualities, just so you get a broader um, overview of what a particular piece of equipment that you're testing is capable of. And that will give you a more balanced view. And you know, we can never get 100% correct. So um, ultimately what matters the most is our satisfaction from, uh, uh, from what we're hearing through our systems. And, uh, you know, if I'm testing, let's say, a loudspeaker set and I bring the wide range of recordings and I'm comparing it to the loudspeakers that I currently have, um, I'm trying to judge what I like the most. So if a particular set sounds good on 80% of recordings and my loudspeakers sound good only on 10% of my recordings, then there is something obviously not right. And I would be leaning towards, you know, switching the loudspeakers to something that, give, that will give me more joy from more uh, music that I have in my collection. Because ultimately that's the most important thing to me, music enjoyment, right? But if you want to take it a step further and get closer to you know what the truth might be uh, you could start attending an amplified concert you know it's it's not perfect and you have to attend a lot of concerts uh, for for the sound of unamplified instruments to actually get ingrained uh, in your memory because as we've established the audio memory isn't that good so if you go to one concert you're not gonna know how something's supposed to sound but if you attend enough of them you will have a better idea of how the cello is supposed to sound how the saxophone is supposed to sound and so on so it, it will give you a, a better reference point so when you listen to something afterwards and you're testing new piece of equipment you can make a better judgment of what the real is, how a particular instrument is supposed to sound and if it's more real or even if it's not real, is it more to your preference or not. So ultimately that's what matters the most, enjoyment of music. Challenge number six, reference point, our adaptability and long-term listening tests. So there are quite a lot of subjects that I want to cover under this challenge. And let me start by saying that human beings have great capability of adapting to different circumstances. And uh, in terms of hi-fi, uh, I would like to you know, illustrate it by giving you an, an example of someone who had loudspeakers that perhaps had a bit too much bass output, right? And we tend to like bass, so uh, up to a certain point, we can tolerate it even if it's slightly too much. And let's say that person was using the speakers for past three years and the sound of uh, those speakers is so ingrained in that person's brain, then they perceive it as neutral or as their reference point. So whenever that person tries to evaluate new set of loudspeakers and they switch between them, you know, in an A-B test, uh, they really don't like the new speakers because the new speakers might be sounding more balanced. They might be sounding more truthful, but to their ears, because of their reference point, they actually sound bass shy, right? And the reason for that is their reference point. And to illustrate that even further, I'm gonna use the visual memory analogy. So have a look at the screen now which red circle appears larger to you on the first glance. So to me, it's always the circle on the right. And the truth is that both circles, both red circles are exactly the same size. The only thing that changes uh, is the size of the surrounding circles. So your reference point. You, you can see where I'm going with it. The same thing applies to our perception of audio. 
you know, depending on what is the reference point, that might skew your perception of, of the, let's say, new equipment that you're trying to evaluate. And I'm gonna give you an example from my own experience. So that was when I, exp when I experienced Harbev speakers for the first time. Uh, you know, there might be different people out there having different opinions about Harbev speakers, but uh, what, you, what majority of people tend to perceive them as is that they are fairly well balanced, fairly natural sounding, perhaps ever so slightly warmer in the mid-range area, but you could never call Harbev speakers bright. They're usually quite well balanced, right? So my preferences in the past, or my preference in the past was always for the relatively bright sounding speakers. I really enjoyed that extra ambience of live recordings, that extra air around the instruments and so on. So whenever I compared my existing speakers with Harbev speakers, I was always disappointed with Harbev's. It sounded like someone put a blanket on the speaker uh, because the, the amount of treble output uh, was so, so much lower than from my existing speakers. So on an A-B comparison, I never liked Harbev. But because, you know, I, I had a great respect for the brand and uh, one of my friends was a big fan, uh, is a big fan of Harbev speakers. So I decided to borrow them for a week and give them a go um, without comparing them uh, directly to my speakers. And you know what happened? After a week of living with Harbev, I started noticing the richness of the vocals. I've started, uh, you know, noticing other stuff that I wasn't getting with my speakers. And I also, did not really miss any air or ambience. So I started questioning what's going on in here, you know, because uh, I was so um, disappointed with them on the direct switch, and yet after a long, uh, long-term listening test, uh, I really enjoyed the speakers to the point that I actually decided to sell my speakers, my existing speakers, and get myself of Harbev speakers. So. What happened there was basically a couple of things. The first thing was that because my reference point at the time was a set of relatively bright sounding speakers, when I switched to Harbev, I was always drawn to the negative differences and I was never able to appreciate the subtle details and other stuff that the Harbev speakers were doing that on direct switch, I, I, I did not really get because I was so drawn to the negative differences or what I perceived as negative differences. Whereas in the long-term listening tests, I had more time, I did not have to switch between stuff, so I was just able to sit, listen, enjoy the music, and actually things started popping out and I was going, oh, oh, this sounds good, oh, this sounds great, and you know, so you notice a lot more things uh, in the long-term listening test. So, this is also the reason uh, why a lot of manufacturers ask you to run in their equipment. And, uh, you know, our adaptability is a double-edged sword. And what, by, what I mean by it, that, uh, yeah, it's great to do a long-term listening test, but we also have a tendency uh, for our hearing to adapt to what we're hearing. And that includes the negative things as well. Uh, and this is the reason why sometimes manufacturers of various equipment ask you to do a running period. Yes, with uh, loudspeakers you've got the mechanical components moving, so the compliance of the drivers might change and so on. So, you know, the, the running period for that sort of, uh, uh, for that sort of uh, mechanical devices I can completely understand, but for electronics Quite a lot of time, the running period is not actually for anything in the equipment to uh, run in. It's for your ears to adjust to what you are hearing, so you are less likely to return the product. Yes, I might be coming across a little cynical about it. Maybe with certain types of gear, there is a, a good marriage to do a, a running period. But, you know, in my experience, it has more to do with your ears adjusting to the sound rather than uh, actually any of the gear doing anything. So. That's the first point. Uh, the, the, the other thing about it is, um, in my own experience, I can demonstrate to you how, how capable we are of adjusting to different sounds. Uh, I received, uh, as a Christmas gift a few years back, I received a concert by a, a Polish rock band. And when I played it for the first time, although I really liked the music, I was really disappointed because to my ears, it had too much bass. Um, but, you know, because I like the music, I listen to it a lot and, you know, I put up with, uh, with excessive bass, if you wish. And if you fast forward two months later, I actually don't have a problem with bass anymore. 
nothing's changed. I've got the same speakers, I've got the same room, everything is the same. The only thing that's changed is the amount of times that I've listened to that particular recording. So what, what, what happened there? Basically my ears and brain adjusted to the sound because I've listened to those tracks so many times that I no longer hear the bass problem. I just hear great music and enjoy it. So you can see how powerful it is and why you have to be so careful with it if you're evaluating equipment and you're doing long-term listening tests. So uh, what can be done about it? Well, there are a couple of things. The first thing is don't only rely on A-B testing because that can be misleading as I've demonstrated uh, previously. Also take into consideration uh, long-term listening tests and their potential side effects. Uh, so, you know, when, uh, by all means do long-term listening tests because they are critical to evaluating equipment, but also when you finish them, always go back to your previous equipment just uh, to get that extra reference point. You know, don't just uh, finish, on the, uh, finish the long-term test on the equipment uh, you've been, let's say, reviewing or evaluating. Always go back to what you've had pre previously just to give you that extra, uh, extra check if you wish. So, like I've said, two things. Don't only rely on A-B tests, do long-term listening tests, but also remember that your ears and your brain adapt to the new sound. So always go back to what, you, what you've had before. Challenge number seven, consistency and reliability of our hearing. If all six challenges that I've covered so far weren't enough, consider this. We like to think of ourselves as superior beings. And indeed, our senses are a marvel of nature but they are far from being reliable. And this is also the reason why in the scientific environment, human testimony is classed as the lowest level of evidence. Have a think about that. How well can you judge the distance with your eyes? Can you tell how many meters away something is uh, to a centimeter? Or how well can you evaluate weight with your hand? You know, can you lift something out and tell me how many grams it weighs exactly? Uh, you know, none of us can, or, or most of us probably cannot do it. And this is why our testimony in science doesn't have a very high value. Also, as I've already established in previous six points, our senses are affected by psychological factors. And not only that, they are also affected by physiological factors. I mean, have you ever noticed that, let's say you came back from a concert, you've been listening to mu uh, loud music for two hours, you get back home, your ears are ringing. Do you really feel like listening? Would you be able to then uh, compare two pieces of equipment and concentrate on the subtleties between them and tell me what the differences are? I very much doubt that. So, you know, the, the, the physiological and psych psychological factors both come into play when it gets to how we perceive things. However, despite of what I've said, human testimony is indeed used in, in science because sometimes there is no other way uh, to go about it. For instance, if a company is trying to release a new set of loudspeakers and they want to find out if their target market is going to like this set of speakers, where obviously they cannot test everyone in the market, so they're gonna use sampling to take a sample of that target market population and, done, and, and do some blind A-B tests with that sample, right? Then they're gonna use a statistical methods to determine if the results of that test are statistically significant. And if they are, then they can be confident that, for instance, the results of the tests say that people really like the new loudspeaker set and they rated us, you know, nine out of 10, then they can be confident due to statistical inference that uh, those results that they, uh, that they got from testing the sample will be applicable to the whole population. So they can then make a decision that we can release that product to the market. And the key here is sample size. So the greater the sample, the more of a chance there is that the results from that sample will be applicable to the whole population. So how does it relate to uh, Hi-Fi or how does it relate to us? Obviously when you're testing things at home, you're not interested if other people are going to like it. What you're interested is if you are going to like it. And what I'm getting at here is you want to ensure that you are liking something because you've got a preference for that particular sound and not because of external factors affecting your preference for it. So the question is, what can be done about it? Well, 
two things here. The first one is whenever you evaluate any equipment or compare equipment, make sure you're well rested. Give your give your ears and brain the the, the best chance for noticing subtleties, picking up on differences and so on. So, you know, make sure that the uh, physiological factors are sorted. Also, you know, do all of the stuff that I've mentioned in the previous six points. Uh, but on top of that, make sure that you apply statistical methods, especially when you do A-B testing. And what I mean by it, volume is your friend and uh, when I say volume I'm referring to a number of tests that you run. When you're switching between the equipment don't just do a couple of switches and, and leave it alone. Do 10 or do 20 and let's say if you had 20 goes switching between two types of equipment and you know 18 or 16 times out of 20 you have a preference for a particular type of equipment, uh, the likelihood is that that preference is a result of this equipment sounding better and not the result of a chance or you being affected by something. So repetition is your friend. And that's the last challenge. Let's move on to a brief summary and conclusions. So we've already determined that there are a number of challenges related to testing hi-fi equipment and I, also, uh, I have also given you some potential solutions to those challenges and how could we mitigate those problems. So let's go through them one by one just so you have a summary in one place. Point number one was to ensure that whenever we change something, we only change one thing at the time. So you have to, you don't want to confuse yourself by changing multiple components. If you're testing something, just change one component at the time and keep everything else the same. And that includes the location. Make sure that whenever you make a change, you're always in the same location, same room and so on. Point number two was quite critical. This is to do with volume levels. Make sure that whenever you're comparing one piece of equipment to another, the volume levels are balanced and they are exactly the same on each equipment. That ensures that what you're hearing is a result of the difference in equipment and not difference in a, one equipment playing at slightly higher volume as it's often the case. Point number three, minimize the time delay between the tests. As we've already established, our auditory memory is not great, so the shorter the time delay between the tests that you run, the more reliable the results of your experiment will be. Point number four. Do single or double blind tests when you're comparing equipment to ensure that your audio perception is not affected by biases. So by doing a single blind or double blind, you, you're trying to eliminate your visual perception affecting the results of your test and keeping yourself honest. Point number five. When you test equipment using music, make sure that you've got a wide, wide range of music with you. Don't only bring the well-recorded audio field discs with you. Bring also stuff that might not necessarily sound very well or your, on your current equipment. Make sure that you've got a wide selection, not only in terms of genres, but also in terms of recording qualities. That will give you a better overview of what particular equipment is capable of. Point number six. Apart from running A-B tests, which I've already covered in this video, also use long-term listening tests, with one caveat. Remember that your ears and brain adjust to the sound that you're hearing over a long time. So whenever you finish a long-term listening test, always go back to the equipment that you started with, just to keep yourself honest. Point number seven, run multiple tests. If part of your equipment evaluation is an A-B testing, make sure that you don't only do a couple of switches, make sure that you switch multiple times. Let's go for 10 goes, do 20 goes. And if out of those 20 goes, 18 times out of 20, you have preference for one particular type of equipment, then you can be confident that it's not the result of a chance, it's a result of you actually prefer that particular piece of equipment. So keep yourself honest. Right, that's pretty much it in terms of potential solutions to the challenges that I outline in this video. And please bear in mind, I'm not trying to spoil this hobby for anyone. I mean, I enjoy switching gear and I also enjoy uh, listening to music, probably more so than actually switching the gear. Nonetheless, you know, I've got limited funds. So whenever I switch uh, equipment, I want to make sure that I do it because I genuinely hear a difference and not because I'm fooling myself. And remember, there is no one easier to fool than yourself. So if you want to, you know, keep yourself honest and save yourself some money in the process, 
just remember the points that I've mentioned, remember the challenges that we've covered in this video and try to use things to mitigate those, mitigate those challenges in order to ensure that whenever you change a piece of equipment you're changing it because you actually like it more and not because you know you're biased or you're affected by some external factors and you sub subconsciously prefer one piece over the other because of those factors. So you know keep yourself honest if that's what you want to do. That's definitely what I want to do. So if you lasted this long Thank you very much for watching. I appreciate it was a fairly lengthy video and I might have made some mistakes in it. So if you come across any, please correct me using the comment section down below the video. Also, if you enjoy this type of educational hi-fi related content, please consider subscribing. That will give me an indication that people are actually interested in this type of content and it will motivate me to do more videos of this type. So once again, thank you very much for watching and hopefully see you in the next video. Bye.